Today I'm looking at 2 Corinthians chapter number 12, verses number 9 and verse number 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Love it. Question I'm going to ask you today is, is your why big enough? Is your why big enough? I'm going to go back a couple weeks and start to kind of bring us more current to what I'm talking about today. A few weeks ago, I said, when God gives you a dream, that was the, the, the point I made. When God gives you a dream, dreams are previews of coming attractions. Dreams are foretelling something that God has in store for you. Uh, you go to movies, and some of us go early because we want to see the previews. We like the previews. We want to get there early. You know, the movie starts, I want to get there early, get my popcorn, sit down, because I want to make sure I can enjoy the previews. And as you're watching the previews, you've seen it. Oh, that looks good. I can't wait to see that. And there's some previews like, oh, I don't think that's going to be too good. <laughs> some previews just kind of like, they should have did a little bit better in the editing short, a little bit better. But anyway, previews excite you about what is to come. Your dreams should excite you. There's something about what God allows you to see that makes you think, I can't wait to see this. I don't know when, God, but I thank you for the preview because the dreams are God's way of letting you know that he has favor in store in your life. He has it in every one of our lives. Your dream is trying to tell you something. Get excited about your dream again. Get excited about that. I've had dreams that were so vivid and so clear that I had to go outside and look and see if I still had that Mercedes S class that I dreamed about. Maybe it's, maybe it's here. But I, maybe it was, it was real. I thought I, I did win the lottery. Maybe I checked my bank account. Maybe I did win. Dreams. The same way we should get excited about every day. There should be something with anticipation that we're looking forward to every day. Have an expectation that this is the day that God has something great in store for you today. Can you receive that? He has something great in store for you today. And then I talked about vision. Some of us have done word search. You remember the word search puzzles? If you, oh, you know those, huh? Okay. <laughs> and it's just a whole series of letters all across there. And it looks like nothing is really happening, but then above that is a key or a clues. And there's these words, and you say, okay, these are the words that I know I'm looking for. And you search out these words, and you circle, some are diagonal, some are horizontal, some are vertical, and, and when you get your last one, you've done something. That's it. I've solved it. That's it. That's vision. But imagine getting the same puzzle with no clues. Now, you had to figure out there's 25 words in here. Can you find that without any clues? That's real vision. You see, because life doesn't give you sometimes the clues. You got to look at every day and know that God has something in there. That You got to look beyond what you see and know that there's something more that you can find. There's a revelation that you get every day if you look deep enough and far enough. That's vision. That's true vision. But no matter how great your vision, no matter how big your dream, it's nothing if your why is not big enough. Why do you want to do this? The first words that we learned, the first question was why? Eat your vegetables. Why? <laughs> it's good for you. Why? It'll make you grow up to be big and strong. Why? Because I said so. Eat your because I said so. Isn't that sometimes our motivation for doing things because someone told you? Jesus loves me. This I know because the Bible tells me so. Is the Bible the only way that you know that Jesus loves you? Is your why not greater than the Bible? Can't you have a greater revelation that Jesus loves you just because you're you? Does Jesus even need to have a reason to love you? 
Can Jesus love all of your faults, all of your issues, all of your past, your present, your future? Can not Jesus just love you because he loves you? Whether someone tells you or not, Jesus loves you. And if no one else tells you, I love you. It's great to know that somebody loves you. Isn't that right? There are people that you don't even know about who love you. They may never come to you and tell you that they love you. There are people who love you and you have no idea that so many people care about you. Difficult question you ask yourself. Why? Why do you keep doing what you're doing? Why do I keep putting myself through this? Why do I get up every day and go through the same thing? Why, why, why? And it's a question that you have to be able to answer if you're going to break through with wherever you are. You have to answer the why question. When people contemplate suicide, they can't answer the why. Why must they keep going on? Why is there a reason to live? They give up hope because there's no answer to the why question. A couple of questions I want to ask you today, and the first one is, why do bad things happen to good people? That's one thing that we sometimes ask. Why do bad things happen to good people? And Job is a great example of that. Uh, Job was one that God loved Job so much that God placed a hedge of protection around Job. It's great to know that God, God has a hedge around you. I don't, you know, I don't know if you know that, but when I look out, I see hedges. I see hedges that God has around you because God loves you that much. And, and even Satan couldn't get access to Job. You know, God says, where have you been? I've been going to and fro, Satan says, on the earth. In other words, he's looking for someone whom he can devour. He says, have you considered my servant Job? And, and, and it was an unfair comment because Satan knew that he couldn't get access to him. And he says, if you will take the hedge away, he'll curse you to your face. He knew that if he could just get access, which means Satan just can't get access to everybody. That when you love the Lord and God's favor is upon you, a hedge of protection is around you and your family and your children. You don't, you don't see the hedge, but the enemy does. And he can't get in, so all he can do is entice you to come out. And the worst thing that happens when he's able to get a believer to come out of the hedge and that's when he gets you. But you're protected by the hedge. But then God allows Satan to have access to Job. And Job began to suffer in his health. He had boils from head to toe. And he would take a potter's glass and scrape the scabs away from him. And he, he sat on ashes. A great deal of suffering Job was going through. And all the people around him were saying, Job, you must have done something. And Job in his heart knew that he was innocent. Then his wife said to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, you speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. When God allows something to happen, he does not say, okay, if you're righteous, I will spare you. If that was the way God did it, then we would come to God only because we want the favor of God. That's not true allegiance. Because if you can't accept the suffering along with the favor, then you're not really, really ready to accept God completely. Because God brings sunshine and God brings rain. And then where I'm from down in Louisiana and maybe where you grew up, a storm can come suddenly. My mom would have clothes on the line. All of a sudden, it's just like, hey, this looks nice. And they'll say, we're running out, get the clothes, get the clothes. We're running out there. We're trying to scramble to get the clothes off the line because the storm has come when? Right now. And sometimes in our lives, we wake up one day and we don't know there's a storm that day. But storms didn't come just in our house, not on just over our land. The whole town had a storm. So everyone suffers the same thing that you've gone through. But hold on to your integrity. Believe that God masters even storms. And even beyond the storm, the sun is still shining. And that storm was going to pass over and we still give God glory. But you don't come to God only because God gets rid of storms in your life. If you still suffer while you're doing good, then why do we do good? If I'm doing good, God, and I'm going through stuff, and you go through a few of those, and you believe that God should spare you from evil, I spare you from hardship, and if you still have them, sometimes we give up our relationship with God because you ask yourself, why? Why do I have to keep being good if 
if this is what is getting me? Why do I keep praying if I haven't found what I've been asking for? God knows what I have need of. Why do I keep being faithful? It seems like so many people out there who don't know God are having a wonderful time. You ever notice that? They're buying new cars, and they're getting promotions, and life is good. And, and you're thinking, God, I'm so good, and I'm still driving this hoopty. God, God where, where do I get mine? Why? And you've got to answer that question. Why do you keep going to church day after day and, and going to groups and reading your Bible and praying and, and you're giving? And why, God, where do I get mine? But you know the Bible says, do not be weary in doing well. Because in due season, you know God has a season, doesn't he? And in your due season, you shall reap. And God says he gives it to you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. That's the God that I know. He opens up the windows of heaven and pour out so much that you will not have room enough to receive it. But if we don't get it in our time frame, we say, God, why, am I, why do I keep going? I think somebody else got my window. God, somebody, somebody else has got my overflow. Whereas, when, when's my window open, God? And we ask ourselves, why? Why? The next question is, why do you follow Jesus? Why do you follow him? Is it because that's how we grew up in church? I grew up, as long as I can remember, that was Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's all, we, that's all I knew growing up. So I knew my mother's Jesus. But why do you follow Jesus? That's, what, that's why do you follow? Not why you come to church, not why you're a Christian, but why do you follow Jesus? Why did you accept him as your Lord and Savior? Because ultimately you've got to know the answer to that question. It can't be the old cliche, well, that's the way I grew up, that's what the Bible says, that's the way we've always done it, uh, it makes me feel good. You've got to know why. When Jesus taught, and I shared with this, I think, last week, when he taught one scripture about eternity, he was teaching on salvation and the sacraments, eating his flesh and drinking his blood and to have eternal life, and many of his disciples walked away from him. And in verse number 66 in John 6, in the southern John 6, 66. Anyway, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. It was too difficult a lesson for them because it was personal. When the scripture becomes personal and, and the message becomes personal, we're challenged sometimes because we do things out of conviction. Why did I do it? Well, the pastor convicted me. You shouldn't do things by force. You should do them by choice. A message should not convict you to do the right thing. You should do it because of your relationship with Jesus Christ. So those that didn't have a great relationship with him, when it got difficult, they walked away because their why was not big enough. Why are you following Jesus? I follow him because he's a great teacher. We saw the miracles. We saw the wonderful things he does. He's a great leader. But deep down, they did not know that him is their Lord and their Savior. They had a different reason. So when the challenges come, the why they follow him was not big enough. And then Jesus said to the 12, the one he chose, do you also want to go away? In other words, why aren't you going? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Why do we do it? Behind every decision that you ever make, there's a why. Why did you marry the person that you married? Why did you join the place that you joined? Why do you live where you live? Why did you choose the car that you drive? Why did you wear what you're wearing today? There's a reason for everything. There's a why. There's a why. And ultimately, if we get behind everything else and find out our why for doing things, our motivation becomes greater because we can change our why. We can do something better. We can do something more. We have to know why we're doing it. We were talking about moving and the place we're going to, we got inspired, we were excited. And then when we started asking for money, you give more, why? Because we now understand there's a direction, there's a destiny. I can give more, why? Because now I know why. But can you still give when you don't know why? Can you still love, can you still share? Can you still serve if you don't know why you're doing it? Sometimes the spirit just compels you to do something, you don't know why. But it's telling you to do something. You just get up. You just follow the unction of the Holy Spirit. That's why. That's why enough. There's a guy named Tony Robbins, a peak performance coach. So most of you probably heard of him. He spent most of his life trying to 
teach people how to unleash the power within and master the game and all kind of things, try to help them go further in their lives. For 30 or 40 years of his life, he's dedicated himself to trying and bring out the best in people. And he has a huge following. In fact, his weekend events, he'll pack eight to 10,000 people in an arena and have these long sessions for day, that goes for days. And people walk out of there with great revelations. Now here's what we don't understand. Everybody that comes there comes there with a purpose. They know that they're gonna leave there differently. Now to get to that event, it costs ten to $20,000 to attend that event. You have to have a why. When you're gonna spend that, you have to know why you're doing that. $10,000 for an event. You believe you're going to leave with a revelation? Absolutely. You're going to go because you come there with enough why. If you spent $10,000, that's why right there. When your why is big enough, you find a way to do whatever you need to do. If you don't like something and then it becomes a life or death situation, suddenly you like it. It's okay. It's palatable now because your why is big enough. When you have a big enough why, you can accomplish things that you never thought was possible. But if you don't know why, if you don't really have a solid reason why you're doing it, then as soon as hardship comes, as soon as difficulty comes, it's too, too much. I don't need this anymore. Why do I need to, need to keep doing this? Why do I tolerate this? This is not what I signed up for. Your why is simply not big enough. Not big enough. Why do you go to church? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you believe in God? Why did you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Why do you tithe? These are all questions you've got to ask yourself. And if you're not able to rise up to that, then your why is not big enough. Simply that. If your why becomes greater, you'll be amazed how your life changes with the why. Why do you want to write that book? Why do you want to start that business? Why do you want to lose the weight or make changes in your life? Why do you want to do these things in your life? Why? And if you can live without doing it, then your why isn't big enough. If you can do exactly the same thing, you figure, oh, if I do it, fine. If I don't do it, fine. Your why is not big enough. But when your why becomes greater, you'll find the time. You'll find the money. You'll find a way out of no way. And you'll accomplish the impossible because your why is big enough. Why did you do this? Yes. Why? Yes. That becomes your reason. Your why becomes your reason. When you're able to do it, you look back and why were you able to do that? Yes. That was why. Because my why became big enough and there was no more excuses. And the reason you did it? Why? Why? My last question is why do you not? feel God's presence. Sometimes we come to church, sometimes we just, I just didn't feel it today. Sometimes I feel it, sometimes I don't feel it. As if it's God's fault. <laughs> God, I didn't feel you today. What happened today, God? You know, I, I, came with, I came really expecting to feel you today, but I, I didn't feel it today. You know, just sometimes I feel it like a nut. Sometimes I'm... <laughs> Psalm 32, verses number one through verse number four. Psalm 32. This is King David. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity, in whose spirit there is no deceit. When I kept silent, my bones grew old through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. Selah. This is at a time when David has sinned with Bathsheba. And David had thought that he had covered everything. He had found an alibi. He had brought a husband in and through deceit and ultimately through murder, he thought that this was all covered. And he thought that God had forgotten about this because he had kind of washed it away. And he didn't understand that God was still looking at him and that God expected something from him. And the whole time when David had not confessed his sin to God, he said it was like the drought of summer. It's something about when God's presence leaves you and you're no longer hearing from God because there's some unconfessed sin that you have in your life. There's some unforgiveness that you're harboring something and what's, God's not keeping himself from you. You are keeping yourself from God because you're not allowing God to have access to you. 
And the only way God can have access, you've got to get rid of everything, every sin, and every weight that so easily besets you. You've got to set everything aside so that you can really hear from God. If you've got stuff that's weighing you down, you can't hear from God if you've got a lot of stuff on your mind. If you're stressed out, it's hard to hear from God with all the stress that goes on. And David was stressed out, and he just didn't know that he had so much within him that he couldn't hear God anymore. He said his bones waxed old. There's a feeling that we get when we're not in communion with God. We had it at one point, but somewhere we lost it. We no longer got up in the morning with our minds stayed on Jesus. We get up and we start looking at our day and what we want to do with our life. We start focusing on ourselves. Then God became an afterthought. And we're wondering why don't we hear from God? God is always present with us. His word says that he will never leave us and he will never forsake us. So if there's anyone that's left, it's us. Because he's always speaking to us. There's a movie that some years ago called Chariots of Fire. A guy named Eric Little. He was an Olympic runner. He won the gold medal in the 1924 Olympics. And he was a favorite to win the 100 and the 200 meters as well as the 400 meters. But as the events were scheduled, he found out that the heats for the 100 meter and the 200 meters were held on a Sunday. He says, I can't do it. Because the Bible says, remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. But you win a gold medal. You, you've trained your whole life for this. And you're the favorite to win. But his why was bigger than a medal. When your why is bigger than you. When your why is bigger than something that you want materially. When your why is all about him. No longer me, no longer about my issues, no longer about my concerns. My why is all about him. And he knows it. He knows that you'll quit, you'll leave him as soon as you got something from him. He knows your why. You say, God, I'm here, I'm here, I'm, I'm not going anywhere. And after Eric won the gold medal in the one event, people were wondering, why didn't you run? You, you would have won the other medals. Let me share with you something that Eric said. He said, God made me for a purpose. And God made me fast. And when I run, I feel his pleasure. To win is to honor him. What do you do that you feel God's pleasure? You are made for something great. And when you're able to do what God alone wants you to do, when you're fulfilling your purpose in life, you feel his pleasure. When you're doing what he's called you to do, you feel his pleasure. There's others around you that get to know him through you because you take pleasure in him and God will honor you. And then when you get up in the morning, you can't wait to see what God has in store. Then you can say, this is the day the Lord has made and I will rejoice this day and I will be glad in it. And you feel him every day. Every day is a wonderful day. Oh, this is the day. This is the day. This is the day. Not yesterday. Not tomorrow. This is the day. Tomorrow's not promised to anybody. This is the day. I don't know why Jesus loves me. I don't know why he cares. I don't know why he sacrificed his life. But oh, I'm so glad. Aren't you glad that he did? Aren't you glad that he looked beyond everything else? He says, you, you, you. You. I'm going to remind this hymn that says, Why should I feel discouraged? Why should the shadows come? Why should my heart feel lonely and long for heaven and home? When Jesus is my captain, a constant friend is he. His eye is on the sparrow. And I know and you should know that he watches me and he, he watches you. His eye is on you. Make a why so big, so big that there's nothing else that matters. You want to live out God's purpose. Why? Yes. Why do you do this? 
Yes. Why do you tithe? Why do you read your Bible? Why do you believe in Jesus? Yes. That's why. Because it's bigger than everything else. Your relationship with God should guide you. Every day you should be revived by that relationship with Jesus Christ. You feel good. May not have everything you want. You may have issues in your health and in your life, but there's something about that relationship that makes you get up. He gives strength to the weak. And those who have no strength, he increases might. The Bible says, but those who wait on the Lord, he'll even renew your strength. You'll be able to mount up with wings like an eagle. You will run and not get weary. You will walk and not faint. Why? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Jesus.